Professor Minsky, first, I'd like to say it's a great honor for me being able to talk with you. I'd like to thank the BBVA Foundation the possibility of talking to such a leading light as yourself, because I began studying science and thought I would dedicate my whole life to scientific research, but things changed, and instead I dedicated myself to the cinema. In my field, the cinema field, as in the field of arts, literature, science fiction is a theme that has given birth to many ideas and many great literary works and films. Are you a science fiction fan? Have you ever been fond of science fiction? Uh, when I was a child, I read many, many stories and books, and most books are about the mistakes people make and how they screw up their lives, and science fiction is about everything else. Do you remember any stories that really grabbed your attention more than any others in science, either in films or literature? Well, when I was very young, I read Jules Verne about how people would someday go into space and Aldous Huxley about mm -hmm. the future of intelligence and uh, there were a few books about H.G. Wells about what would happen in future history and uh, but there were not many such books and I was very fortunate because when I finished all those books and I was perhaps 10, 12 years old then a new generation, John Campbell and Isaac Asimov and Arthur Clarke and the new generation of science fiction writers came into the world and I met them all. I was very fortunate to be in the right place. I'm in the same position but just the opposite. Today with you, you're an outstanding expert on artificial intelligence and I have the chance to talk with someone who works with science, whilst I work with fiction. I'd like to know what you think about the cinema. In the film world, when talking about robots and machines, and this is a recurring topic, when we discuss robots and machines, we say they talk like ourselves. Do you like the way how the film industry has adapted the theme of artificial intelligence? Yes, I think the film industry did very well in uh, anticipating how artificial intelligence would develop. It was uh, quite impressive to see what happened in, in film with uh, especially Stanley Kubrick and uh, a number of others, very sensitive treatment of speculations about the future. I understand that you had a close working relationship with Stanley Kubrick during the preparation of the 2001 shooting. Is that so? Did he really consult you on how HAL, that terrible machine, should be like? Well, that was a very amusing cooperation because uh, Stanley Kubrick would not tell me anything about the plot. <laughs> and uh, or would Arthur Clarke and so I was mainly concerned with the set and I think I designed the mechanical hands mm -hmm. that Hal used to destroy the astronaut and uh, it was wonderful working with Kubrick because he has no ego any criticism he would respond take it very seriously. Sometimes he would destroy an entire set if, if one comment misunderstood the... So he, he was a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. Didn't you know that the HAL robot or machine would be an evil machine? Perversa. Well, we still don't know really what the motives of HAL were in the end, but 
uh, there's no Stanley to tell us. I understand that Isaac Asimov was one of your neighbors and you had some kind of contact with him. Yes, and he did not want to visit our laboratory because he was afraid it would interfere with his imagination. <laughs> But after a few years, when our robots became a little bit more competent, mm -hmm. uh, then he would visit. Dejando aparte el cine, eh, usted sabrá que esta semana. Leaving films aside for the moment, by now you'll have found out that this week in the science pages, in all the newspapers, they've been talking about this program, Eugene, that has passed the Turing test. For people who don't know what the test consists of, it's a test created in 1950, where a machine has to convince a number of judges who ask it random questions that it is a human and not a machine. Personally, I think the test is totally unscientific. What do you think about the test? People should not believe very much of what they hear these days. We're, we're still beginners. We know a great deal about how an insect works or um, simple, simpler animals, but it seems to me that the science of, of uh, how uh, human brains work is still very much in its beginning and maybe another 10 years or 100 years before we understand very much about how the human brain works. And maybe the science fiction writers have just as good theories of the brain as the scientists of the day. It, it would be a paradox. <laughs> maybe the writers are better than the scientists still, and I hope this will change, but I've learned more from Arthur Clarke and uh, people like that than from the biologists. It seems that we measure the power, the capacity of a machine, in this case of artificial intelligence, based on how much it's like us human beings. Should that be the trend? Should we try to make machines that are like us? It probably doesn't make much sense for the machines of the future to to look like animals because uh, animals evolved to climb trees and, and uh, now our fingers are the important thing and mm -hmm. uh, the people who type more quickly are, uh, have an advantage over the people who can run more quickly. Eh, hasta ahora la mayoría de máquinas que hemos diseñado, los humanos, <clears throat> Up till now, most of the machines that we as humans have designed have aided us, have helped us in our work. Do you really think there is a future for social machines? Machines that keep us company rather than machines used to make our work easier? That's a, a great question is, will we mass produce machines and have them then specialize to do different jobs, or will we build machines specifically to do different jobs so that in the future many machines will be different? And of course, when that happens, there will be advantages of specialization, but there will also be complications because if the machines are different, then they might misunderstand each other and get into arguments and fights and uh, no one can predict the future of these things. The, the hard problem is where will people a hundred years or five hundred years from now, uh, where will people pos be positioned in relation to their machine descendants because people don't change much in a thousand years mm -hmm. and machines change very much in 10 years. So there's different speeds of history here and I don't think anyone uh, knows what will happen. Yeah. <laughs> a raíz de esto que me dice, eh, 
Following what you have just said, there is something that any observer who has watched how emotions work for animals, work for us, can understand. And it's that emotions have allowed us to get here, to survive. In that future world with machines, because we will live in a more technically sophisticated world, will our old emotions be just as effective? Well, emotions, what are emotions? We could think of emotions as different ways of thinking. And I think it's a mistake to to think of emotions and thinking as opposed or complementary, they're just different. And there are many ways to think and many ways to solve problems. And uh, we don't have good theories of these things yet. In a sense, if you look at psychology and theories of psychology, the writing of Plato and Socrates and uh, out, uh, people like that 2,000 years ago, very much the same as the writing of scientists uh, 200 years ago. So 2,000 years went by with ups and downs. Augustine, uh, a religious philosopher, was also a great great psychologist, mm -hmm. and Sigmund Freud was a great psychologist, mm -hmm. and there's not much difference between these people. So it's in the last hundred years that there was a great change, and uh, to me, history, you could, you could remove the last 2,000 years and nobody would notice. <laughs> uh, what will happen next in 10 years, and 10 years and 10 years, I think those will, are likely to produce changes that correspond to 1,000 years and 10,000 years of the past. So no one can predict what will happen to mental history of the future. I think maybe this is an obvious question. You have a perspective of the last 60 years of artificial intelligence. That is surely all the time that artificial intelligence has existed. What are you most proud of? Which of your achievements or theories are you most proud of? Oh, that's a very hard question. The history of artificial intelligence is rather short because there were many ideas about how minds work in the last thousand years, but not very many good ideas. And the first great psychologist after Aristotle and that period 2,000 years ago was around 1900, Freud and a few psychologists like that. Another bunch of ideas which were more scientific and the idea that of how such machines could work really didn't come to fruition till the 1940s or 50s when the first computers appeared. Many people don't realize that there were no computers in 1930. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one or two computers in, in the, of sorts in 1940s, but they could mostly predict the course of an airplane or something like that. And then suddenly, a flood of these ideas. And I was a young student in college at Harvard when one of the first computers there started to work. Very few people appreciated that it could do more than uh, arithmetic. And uh, things proceeded very, very rapidly. A new generation of ideas every two or three years so from 1950 to 1970, 80 was a wonderful period where you had to change everything you mm -hmm. thought. But now it's a little slower because the universities have stopped growing. And if a student wants to do something new, they have to start a company. It's slow. 
They have to raise money. They have to do things that are not research. It's a little bit more difficult now than it was 20 years ago. I'd like to see another golden age start up again, mm -hmm. but I don't know who will do it. Yes, let's say that the golden age of artificial intelligence at a research level, we could say it was the 60s, 70s and early 80s, what is the reason behind the sudden freezing of all progress in this area? Why the slowdown? Is it a financial issue in the universities? Not exactly. It was due, I think, there was no supervision of the military research money. And so there were places in the military budget where pure science was done almost recklessly. Mm -hmm. It was the opposite of what people think. The military did basic research for the fun of it, for the pure understanding of complicated phenomena. It was the civilians who had to do things that had some immediate purpose, because if you didn't get your money back in three years, uh, you were out of business. And very few people understand that the military was the detached beneficial source of funding for a great deal of research because the people had no selfish interest. Mm -hmm. It's a joke. Of course, uh, it isn't entirely true, but there was huge amounts of money that no one knew what to, more than you needed. And that's, that disappeared pretty much in, in 1980s and 90s. Now it's hard to do civilian research for the fun of it. Can we say that the end of the Cold War ended the development, progress and pace in artificial intelligence research? I think that's a good way to put it. The, <clears throat> the Cold War was really a fountain of youth for research. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> For literature and the cinema, the future is always a good source for new stories. There is an atavistic fear about what will happen in the future. Are you optimistic about the future, or just like in the cinema, you envisage dark times ahead? Yes and no. I think uh, <coughs> there's so many things we could be doing that we could afford, but somehow the mechanisms of society for basic research are not working out very well or haven't worked so well in the last 10 or 20 years as compared to to the generation before that and i'm not a good enough historian to to speculate on why things are less exciting today but I think it's some serious problems of economics and uh, overpopulation and stresses in budgets. We have an aging population and uh, all sorts of annoying problems that, that we didn't have 100 years ago. And they're beginning to press in too many mm -hmm. places at the same time. So most economies are just barely managing to be stable, cutting off the luxuries and uh, made, trying to make ends meet with difficulty. The weather is going to get worse and the energy crisis is, is coming. Population is too big and uh, we have a lot of problems that no one knows how to face today. So I'm a little bit gloomy about how to fix these problems. Everyone is. 
Intentaremos we'll try to have cold blood and try to fix them. We have to hurry. <laughs> I think the problem is to realize how much we are in a hurry about this. It seems that the problem will become greater tomorrow, but the reality is that the problem is already great today. Right, right. We can't just think. We don't have time to think about it. Well, it's been a great pleasure talking with you. Well, it's wonderful to have such good questions for a change. Thank you.